We've had a problem in the communities for some time, but it seems to be reaching levels higher than we've seen previously. And that is that people have been innocently engaged online. It may be in uh, charity chat rooms, Christian chat rooms, or on online dating sites. Uh, it may be uh, um, romantic interests, but essentially people are establishing positions of trust with people they've never met and they're based overseas. And as a consequence of that, there are requests being made of them and the excuse has been given, listen, you know, it's so much cheaper to buy an iPhone or a computer or a laptop or some form of device or even clothing in Australia than it is in our country. Would you mind doing me a favour and uh, I'll order it and pay for it and it'll be delivered to your address and then you won't forward it to me. Would that be all right? And if they trust these people by this stage and they say yes. Consequently, a parcel will arrive and it may contain any form of uh, commercial product and they forward the goods onto normally an, over, an overseas address. Uh, quite often it'll be West Africa, Nigeria or Ghana are the primary destinations. Also, sometimes we see it actually may be to another destination in Australia before it even goes overseas. So someone may say, well, I'm not going to send it overseas. Oh, would you send it to a friend that I have in Brisbane as opposed to or Melbourne or Sydney? And they say, well, they don't see that much as too much of a problem. They say, yes. So consequently, what we, they don't know is that the goods that have been delivered to their address have been illegally obtained through the use of um, compromised credit cards. The merchant has no idea that the order they take online or over the phone has been paid for because it's a recently compromised card that has not been cancelled. Uh, the transaction goes through as if it was a normal process and of course it's been delivered to an address in Australia so there's, there's less than any amount of suspicion. The people then on forward it and what they are doing is they're what we term property mules. Um, just like you would have a drug mule to courier um, drugs through uh, from point A to point B, these people are property mules facilitating the transfer of ill-gotten goods into the hands of criminals. People don't, generally don't understand what they're getting involved with. They don't understand that they're enabling the commission of a crime. And we're seeing more, more of it come through um, our desks. And it's really important that we get the message out there for people not to get involved with this activity. They are enabling the commission of a crime. If they do so knowingly, they could, be, they could be the subject of police inquiries. We want to avoid that. And we don't want the millions of dollars leaving this, uh, this country every year to go into the pockets of criminals overseas. What do you put this increase down to? Like you're seeing more and more of this happening? Well, it's just, it comes back to more and more social activity on the internet, more and more take up of the internet of people, that the internet becomes more a part of our everyday lives. It's part of our social fabric now. And we've got crooks, of course, waiting out there just to take advantage of online relationships. How, how much of an increase has there been confirmed at a, a quantum level? No, no. Most of it doesn't get reported to us. It's, it's through the voyage of self-discovery. Um, mm. But, for example, the troops uh, were down the coast just recently and all of a sudden what they thought was one inquiry turned into up to nearly 30. Uh, inquiries and it became a whole network of friends through trusted charity links that were being exploited by these crooks and uh, you know they've got photographs of the alleged person who we pointed out to them was actually uh, well I've got a photograph of a US marine officer um, that my people showed them that that was just stolen off the internet and the like and we're seeing more often than not it's a romance victim or an elderly person, a senior person within the community, and that trust has just been abused, exploited and breached. Are these, these men women? Can you tell us about who primarily these victims are? Uh, yeah, more often than not women. But we've also seen where they've exploited um, businesses that host virtual offices, um, storage shed facilities, and the property that's been delivered can uh, vary anything from a pair of Birkenstocks to uh, a case of uh, printer cartridges. How, how do you come about these instances? Does it require, are you following the trail of your credit card fraud or does you need someone to come forward and say, look, I've got something to do, I've rewarded you? Um, it's been a variety of norms, but sometimes it'll come across the fact that we've identified someone as being a, uh, um, 
a victim of a romance fraud, and as a consequence of that, we identify other activities they've been involved with or they've been asked to participate in. Um, it's never, or it's very, very rarely would it be the credit card fraud. That's the irony, is that we go, go back to the, the retailer and say, listen, this uh, computer you sold uh, has been paid for by an, uh, a compromised credit card, we believe. And they'll say, no, no, everything's fine, the transaction went through. I'll say, well, yeah, but just wait 30 days until the account holder disputes the transaction and you're going to be out of pocket. So it's quite bizarre that we actually have battles sometimes to try and get the property back and, and bring a resolution to it. Um, it's all about making the sale first and worry about the aftermath later, but we don't want that to be the case. We want people to be more on their guard. So who loses out here? Is it the retailer that ends up out of pocket? The retailer is out of pocket. And what you're saying is that in the process of that, the sale's gone through, but you're trying to catch it before the goods actually travel overseas? That's exactly right. And also, in, very often, that the, uh, the sender, the property mule themselves, will be out of pocket because they're promised compensation uh, for the, uh, the cost of freight to the overseas destination, or sometimes the within Australian destination. And of course, that doesn't happen. Um, and is it Can I just and one more uh, entity that's out of pocket? Quite often, the freight company has been paid for by a compromised credit card. But again, uh, the criminal is quite reliant upon the fact that uh, people get their statements 30 days later, thereabouts. Um, they may not review it in detail straight away at the time, and they seem to uh, uh, exploit those opportunities. And, and when the goods go to West Africa or Nigeria or whatever. Is there like a big industry there then selling it there? Is that what, what's happening? Because it sounds like a huge rate of food. Yeah, I mean, there's an industry there. They, they can do it to order for the property. Um, they can sell the property or they can use it for themselves. So. Okay, what, what sort of, how much, how many millions would you estimate is going on this type of business? Look, I, I wouldn't, that would be improper for me to say. This is an Australian-wide industry. Oh, we'd be talking millions without question. Without question. I mean, just the... Uh, um, straight away, just we just one box intercepted there a couple of days ago, and there's um, three, four thousand dollars worth of goods. We've had other instances in the past where there's an entire crate, forty thousand dollars worth of printer cartridges. And when the troops turned up at the storage warehouse, which was the delivery point on the Gold Coast, there was about an equally uh, forty thousand dollars worth of cartridges waiting for transfer. Oh, it's where the population is. So the southeast corner at the moment, but uh, it would it'd be occurring anywhere in Australia. Are people being asked, or is victims being asked to pay for the, the freight over to West Africa? Yes, on occasions, yes. But they trust this person, they're going to get the money back, so, or they love this person, they don't mind spending it. What is your warning to people? Because obviously there are legitimate people who uh, send goods off to people overseas that have legitimate links. So what's your message to people about their dealings with If you are... If you are asked to receive property on behalf of another and send it to another destination, don't do it. Get police advice on the situation you're involved with um, because you may be facilitating the commission of a crime. What are, what are the implications of that? I mean, have you ever gone to that extent and charged someone with that? Yes, we have. Well, can you detail and that was a situation where we had a woman who was involved in a romantic uh, um, relationship with a male person in Nigeria and she received uh, over $125,000 worth of compromised goods. Um, in that instance, because of the sheer volume, every week parcels were turning up to be uh, shipped overseas and there was evidence there that we could show that she actually had insight to what the situation that was occurring and she willingly participated in that process. So as a consequence, she was charged with fraud. Uh, I can't remember. It was, a, it was I think it might have been a plea in the end, but I'd have to check that for you. But your warning is more targeted at the, the naive side of it, I guess, that people aren't aware of what's, what's going on. That's right. Most people would be horrified to think that they're facilitating international crime and uh, f become involved with a process that victimises Australian businesses. Um, they would be absolutely horrified. So you don't want to have uh, to you know be involved with such a distasteful exercise and. There are crooks out there will, waiting and ready and willing to predate upon you. So the idea of trust on the internet has to probably take a little different uh, form of advantage. If I prompted you in the street and asked you to receive some property for me and send it overseas, you'd say, uh, yeah, take another pill. But the reality is, online, the trust factor seems to um, 
almost the bar doesn't exist sometimes. You talk about the Dole Valley being in the millions. Where would you put the, the number of victims that you've had dealings with? Oh, it's completely unknown. Either we've had dealings with. Yeah. Well, the, the one, the network, oh, I shouldn't say the network, but we identified a group of victims on the cold case just recently in the last uh, couple of weeks. And there was over 30 people, and that was from one inquiry, around 30 people, from one inquiry. Uh, some were, yes. Some There were some links there. So you'd say in the hundreds then, you'd imagine, of Queenslanders that are... Oh, I'd, I'd suggest thousands. What we're seeing is, is the criminals will operate different tactics at different times. So when they get someone who's a romance victim, they've got them in line. We know there are thousands of those across Australia. Um, they will then use that linkage to then facilitate the acquisition of property. The West Africans seem to have an unlimited supply of compromised car data from around the world. You know, there's uh, indications now they've linked up with different uh, aspects of uh, Eastern European organised crime and they're trading in um, compromised card data. And once they've got that data, uh, they're just smashing us. And what about the ages of the victims? Do you, is it, you know, the More of, age bracket? Oh, in the senior category. Senior. Very often. Seniors being over 50. And what kind of property are you fighting? What's the strength of seniors? Oh, um, well, anything that's just from a pair of Birkenstocks to computers, laptops, iPads, phones, um, high-def cameras. It's whatever they want. It's pretty much anything that can be purchased online. Is there any way of... There's no real way of stopping this there. Just, it's just education and trying to get... It's very much education and trying to get people to question what they've been asked to participate in. We're looking at... Um, approaching some of the freight companies and asking them to actually put in greater risk management processes into the system as an uh, early warning. Um, and tr we're still trying to put together the picture of how we're going to approach this as a, from a more strategic level. But the reality is it can be prevented through awareness and education and that's why getting this message out through the media and making people think about what they're doing and who they're dealing with will save a lot of this nonsense going on what we're talking about, which I think is far better than uh, not talking about it. We don't need, to be honest, we don't know the full extent of this problem. We postulate based on the amount of cash we see going overseas, which still is extremely problematic. We know that more and more people are getting online and the internet every day. We know that we have a society that is not prepared for the vagaries of the internet. There's been no broad-based cyber education out there and that if people are put online every day that are ill-prepared for the environment, that don't understand the threats, and don't understand the consequences of trusting people online that you've never actually met. Sorry, does that answer your question? So I th it's a very broad issue. It's not a police issue, it's a social issue, to be fair. And it's an, it's an issue for industry to actually, you know, I, I was talking to someone from industry the other day and I said, to, well, what's your fraud losses? And they said, oh, it's very, virtually nothing. I said, well, what are you talking about? They said, oh, two percentage points. And I said, right, yeah, what's that in, in dollars in your, for your industry? And they said, 20 million. But they don't have a fraud problem. And that's a problem. So much fraud now is just does, does dealt with as a uh, profit and loss exercise, and it's an acceptable loss as part of doing business. And I, from a policing perspective, struggle with that because I don't want to see any fraud. And to me, a fraud is a fraud. It's a crime, and it needs to be held to account. But if we continue to look at it as a uh, part of an expensive part of doing business, we're not going to be able to get the information we need to address the real issues. Given that it's such a growing area, have you got enough? Next question. No, <laughs> is that a no? Are you looking for more in London? In Look, what I the, the thing we have very much focused on here in Queensland is being proactive and preventing. You, uh, cybercrime is destined to grow. The average take up of the internet at this globally in the world is only thirty four percent. Now, as the rest of the world migrates, we're going to see an increase in the criminal component online and it's going to get worse. And we've got to focus on target hardening our environment through prevention and awareness messaging. And that's where we've, uh, oh, I would, you know, we're trying to provide more, more education and allowing people to prepare themselves because it can be prevented. And the majority of, um, don't get me wrong, the internet's a good place. You know, it's a, it's a good tool. We're out there every day and I sort of draw the comparison between the internet and the, if you like, the Pacific Highway. It's used by a million people plus every day, millions of people. 
Um, for most people, they get from point A to point B without any problems whatsoever. But when you go on the Pacific Highway, you know that there are risks. You know that um, some people may behave poorly. Um, you cannot ever discount 100% there's going to be an accident, but you're insured against it. But the difference is, though, and just like the internet, but the difference is that when you go on the Pacific Highway, before you're allowed to go on it, you've actually, you go through an education process, a, a practical testing process, and you're prepared for the environment, you identify the risks, you're insured against it. There are, there's a regulation framework. If someone misbehaves, there's a chance they're going to get caught and there are consequences. We don't have that in the cyberspace. And please don't misquote me because there's no way am I advocating that you should have a licence to go online. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you're prepared for that environment and you know and understand the risks and take measures to deal with it. And there are regulatory processes, whereas the internet is completely void of uh, those issues. So to stay on top of this growing problem, how many more resources, how much more resources do you need? We don't need more resources. What we need is a more aware public who have been appropriately... Uh, so you don't need more officers to help track this down and stay on top of it and to educate the public and investigate the growing... If we can do a uh, put it through strategies that actually prevent people from getting involved, in it, we don't have to reactively respond with investigation, and that's where we need to be. So you're totally comfortable with how you're resourced to uh, your department and areas resourced to handle this problem? It's not my position to get involved in resource arguments, but we do a, a, a damn good job like with what we've got. Oh, I'm not here for wish lists. Come on. <laughs> Look, you know I can't go down that argument, um, but I've got a team of people that are brilliant and do a fantastic job and face these battles every day. But our best ally is an informed public. 